explainer that we had started a little earlier and promised you on. And the question I'm asking you tonight is, do you believe the increased, the proposed increase in NHIF rates will offer you better health care at facilities wherever you are across the country? The hashtag is the explainer at Citizen TV Kenya at Yvonne Okwara. My guests are still here with me. Um, one of the questions that I have seen uh, been asked on uh, on social media, I will get uh, to you, Bonasio, in, in just a minute, is the issue of trust and Kenyans are at a place where, um, you know, they want to know if they can trust NHIF with more money, considering a lot that has happened with NHIF currently, with, with all the funds that have been collected so far. Um, the scandals, as you know, are, are several um, from uh, claims of 10 billion shillings being lost through uh, fake claims. Um, there is the NHIF civil servant scheme that uh, there was alleged irregularities, and those are just, uh, you know, to name a few. And so some say, I mean, that's great. It's, it's a great plan. You've benchmarked it. You've done your actuarial reports uh, and studies. But where does my money currently go, and why should I trust you with more of it? Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Um, on that perspective, as a fund, we are looking at it in two ways. One is increased resources for the healthcare, that is uh, more money for the health. And then two is the value. What value addition are we getting for every shilling spent? It would be good that uh, next year I come here and tell you that for every uh, billion shillings spent on maternity services, for example, uh, the maternal mortality has reduced by X percent. The infant mortality has reduced by Y percent. That's where we want to go. But to be able to build that trust and to get to what we are targeting, there are four things that are being done uh, concurrently. One is the legal framework. You've been hearing about the amendments to the NHIF Act. It was accented to in uh, January 2022. And then there are regulations which uh, have been built, and it's uh, one of the things that uh, you quoted earlier. That provides us with the legal framework to be able to achieve what we're looking for. Then the next thing is organizational. Within the organization, yes, we appreciate their challenges. And uh, you had the chair yesterday mention that, yes, there are some challenges internally. So there are those challenges that we have, and they are being addressed. One of the key challenges are regarding the human resource that is available at the fund. Then uh, third bit is on digitization. Uh, there are platforms that have been used or in the recent past. Uh, at the moment, if a doctor's a license number is used to make a request, they will get a notification that your number is being used for this particular kind of service. Are you the person who has uh, requested for this? If a patient's card is used to access a service, they will get a message notification that uh, your card has been used for you. So those are some of the initiatives that are being done through the digitization platform. But then there's still quite a bit that needs to be done. And uh, one of the things that uh, we are targeting to do over the next four years is uh, the back-end rules to do what is called auto-adjudication. A claim comes in, the system should be able to review and indicate that it's not possible to have this kind of utilization in this facility maybe because their bed capacity does not support it and all that. So those kind of checks within the system are still not there. Then the final bit is on the product itself. At the moment, the product is well defined. Uh, three years ago, uh, the fund would say we are covering basic lab investigations, mm. but it's not specific what those basic lab investigations are. But if you go into the system <coughs> now, we can tell that uh, these blood tests are covered, these ones are not covered, uh, the immunohistochemistries are not covered, the, la uh, the LFTs, the, they're called the liver function tests are covered, all that has been defined. So it's a lot more explicit in terms of the product that is being offered. What is the reimbursement? The reimbursement is also defined. And then internally, we do what is called strategic procurement. It's not just about the, having the product, but getting the maximum value for uh, what, how you are purchasing that product. So those are the measures that are being put in place to build in the trust and get the value for the money that is uh, being contributed by the member. Okay, I'll come back and talk about the value and if there are increased benefits that would come with the increased um, contributions. But, you know, there is the issue of, of, of corruption, um, you know, that has, and, and you've, you know, clearly talked about some of uh, the measures on an operational level. Um, but this is a country where you see funds and you see them going. And then you go to the hospital the next day with your card and you're told, you know, we're not providing this service. So particularly to address the issue of, 
of, of corruption. How do we know that maybe things have changed within the NHI for you taking stricter measures on persons who are found to be, um, you know, uh, playing around with, with, um, with the funds? Let me give you an example with the latest uh, issue of, um, of some type of false claims. In fact, the suspension came from the ministry, from the CS, rather than from, some would say, uh, your office. Why wasn't that taken up by the NHIF itself, but rather from uh, the ministry? Is it that the NHIF itself, you know, does not have the capacity, the will? Um, you know, we hear rooting out cartels. Can that not be done at the NHIF uh, itself? Uh, thank you. Actually, I would uh, correct you on that. Even before the expose that was there, there are two facilities which had already been suspended by virtue of engaging in medical fraud and investigations had been done in this facility. And then one of those facilities that was there in the expose was actually there in an audit report that had been recommended for actioning. So we regularly take up these checks. And even as at now, there are about 44 facilities which are in what we are calling a red list. So they are being investigated on exactly what might be happening in those facilities because the utilization is not concurrent with what we expect from those facilities. So yes, there are internal measures that uh, are usually put in place to be able to identify this and take the punitive actions as far as uh, the contract engagements with the facilities are concerned. This just came at an opportune time to be able to highlight the challenge that is there as far as medical fraud is concerned. All right, Dr. Nikala, are you satisfied with the legal framework, the structures that they're talking about, the reforms um, that would then guarantee security of the monies already that we have been collecting and now with a proposed increase? Well, I think what I can say is the effort that is being made, but actually an achievement, I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied mm -hmm. because I know uh, as a, as a, as a uh, legislator and also as a representative of the people, how many people are actually just not getting what they need. Yeah. Uh, when people go to facilities, they, they can't uh, get the services, they're turned away. And uh, sometimes when the facilities, uh, the providers have made, have provided the services, they don't get payment. And uh, so all those things means that things are not working out well. So I think as, uh, the CEO is uh, saying that they, they, are, they are making the uh, restructuring. I think the effort is there, we hear it, but it will, it will only be important when we can see it on the ground, when people see it. But you see, the side we have seen is the side of payment. Mm -hmm. We have not seen the side of the service uh, delivery, yeah. which to some extent may not be in his hands. So then that will bring you to whether you are getting these services from the private sector mm. or from the public sector. Mm -hmm. How well prepared are those because when I'm paying, when I'm a contributor, yeah. I, I want to do a very simple thing. I paid, yeah. I hold a card, I go to the nearest facility, yeah. I get treatment, mm -hmm. I go home, yeah. tick. Mm -hmm. But if I pay and I go to the services and I don't get the treatment, I, I'm not very keen to know who is failing. I just say things are not working. Mm. They'll say, we are not going to give you a service because we have not been paid. Mm. We are not going to give you a service because the service you want has not been authorized. Uh, we are not going to give you a service because we are not a member of, of or we are, we are not uh, in the panel yeah. of NHF. We are not going to give you a service because what NHF is paying is not enough to cover what you need. Now, those are the areas. In my view, and, and, and I've always hoped that this will happen, we should reach a situation where the average uh, small or middle uh, private health facilities, all public health facilities, would have a walk-in, walk-out without many questions. And that most of the services that, they, that you require, whether it is a lab you are required, whether it is admission you required, whether it is a radiology you require, patients don't want to know those things. They just want to know, 
I went there, and with this card, mm. that's what happens with the, with the, with the private insurance. Yeah. Because it's expensive. Yeah. You walk into a hostel, if it's a, if it's a hostel that has got arrangement with your insurance, most often you find that you just put the, the you give the card, you get in, you are admitted, you go out, then uh, on the day of discharge, you are seeing mm. what the charges are. Mm. So we need to reach that level. It may not be possible, as I know, there are realities mm. that all hostels, like say Nairobi hostel, uh, the big hostels, that you walk in and walk out with the NHIF because the cost would probably be enormous. But what most Kenyans would need, uh, I call them mid-level private facilities, mission health facilities, mm -hmm. and all, mm. I'm saying all, uh, uh, public facilities. I don't even see why the level six facilities yeah. would not give a full cover. Because mm. if those who are working, then you take care of majority of the people. The people who want a nice bed and 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 and, and, and comfortable place in in, in Nairobi or Raga Khan, those are not really the problem uh, that uh, of the country. Yeah. If you know you can get basic, yeah. then the choice. And is, Where is you are now going after that? Is up to you. Up to you. Okay. All so right. That yeah. is what uh, I'm looking forward to, and then I'll say I'm satisfied. His efforts, I know, have been in the sector, mm. and uh, even the issues that we are not, he hasn't addressed. Mm. The issue of fraud, mm. big, uh, big. So those ones deplete the resources so that you, 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 you don't know whether he can tell us whether you have the money available all the time or whether you don't trust them and what system do you have in a place yeah. to know that when this claim is made, I'm paying for a service that was offered uh -huh. and not a fake service. And I'm giving it to a person who is actually my contributor, yeah. not somebody who is not my contributor but has, has faked themselves in. Yeah. So these are, these are the issues. Yeah, that we and, and, and we need to address those. You've raised an important point, Dr. Nikal, about the services. People want to go to the hospital. They want to get the services they require for whatever um, ailment has brought them to the hospital. What would it take from a practitioner's point of view, Dr. Miskela, for you and your colleagues across the fraternity, I mean, it's clinical officers, nurses, you name it, all healthcare officials, to be able to provide the services that that they require. Would this increase of 2.75 be, is it for you the silver bullet? Great, we have more money. Therefore, you know, paint for us that, that connection. Where, where is the, the missing link that would enable you provide the services to Kenyans when they come to see you? Yes. So an apt question, because you know, as I sit here, I don't just sit as a worker whose money is going to be deducted. I'm a service provider mm. who have to provide that service. And if I fail the patient in my case, I'm the person that the patient faces every day, every time that card fails. And most of my members... But they're not Dr. Dr. No, Kohora. They yes. <laughs> they deal with it is the you they deal with. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It is me who is running that facility that when the drugs run out because NHIF has not paid, I pay for that price. And that's why, as a union, we keep on saying that we are not going to achieve this UHC piggy riding on the back of private health system. So far in this country, we have literally killed the public health system at the benefit of the private. So that even in the whole financing aspect of it all, we are financing almost 80% of NHF collections go to private hospitals. And we all know that they don't open those hospitals because they care about you. It's about business. They want to make money. And that's the same money that the fraud comes in. Yeah? But more importantly that, how can we then make the public health care system better so that when you use that money in a public facility, when you have the Eduafia, that high school child goes to a public hospital, how do they employ it back to improve the hospital mm. service, mm. to employ more doctors, mm. to employ, buy more drugs? Because I used to work in a facility where the uptake in that region for NHF was like 80, 90%. But every time they came from the first investigation to the drug that they go home with, they have to buy outside. And that is what Kenyans are making noise about. That after you've taken my money with 3%, 10%, can I just sit back and say that for healthcare, I'm sorted mm -hmm. or not? The other issue is that the model of how we have to finance our healthcare system, 
this contributory system, the German system, where the workers, people who are working, formerly employed, are contributing, can't work. Not in a country where only 20% are formerly employed. How are you going to force those who are in the informal sector to come on board? And that's why I agree with what my colleague said, that can we then find a way that is tax-based, where everybody can pay a tax and then it's used, used in other countries? Yeah? So let's not sit back and imagine that that person who is still struggling to pay for the border, border higher purchase will faithfully be sending a thousand shillings. Mm. But worst of it all, that, that whole model then beats the whole concept of insurance, where you're supposed to pull risks so that when you don't fall sick, somebody else will fall sick. But we all know that in the informal sector, out of the 80% in the NHIF, among the 24%, 27% talked about, they only pay when they are sick, then drop off. 75% of NHIF registration drops off after one year. Why? Because somebody falls sick, pays, gets treatment, then goes. It's like having a car. Then you get an accident, then you pay for the insurance. After knowing that, even if you made me pay for one year, that's 6,000 shillings. Mm. And I broke a bone and you used 120,000 shillings. Yeah. You're going to be making losses constantly. And that's why we must bring in as many people into the bracket. But another thing that we have to do also is that even for those who are formally employed, mm. let's not take them away. Currently, the government is just, I don't know what kind of game they're playing. Because the same government say that we don't have enough money in NHIF, if we want to increase. The same government that takes away the police from NHIF, the military from NHIF, the teachers from NHIF, and the county workers to private insurances. Mm. So what, you, we can't have it both. We either choose to fund this vehicle and we improve our services, or stop <coughs> this thing of burdening some few innocent people, mm. as you, the others just benefit and enjoy. I want to stay on that uh, issue of, um, you know, who we are taxing. And we'll come back and talk about uh, the unemployed and, and, and that increase to 1,000 shillings uh, for a moment. Uh, but just to pick up from what Dr. Miskela said, Dr. Kigondo, you'd started to, um, you know, allude to this. So paint the picture for us of this person who has been paying NHIF, who will now get that increase to 2.75%. Uh, but what What's the sort of economic environment for them? Uh, you know, you were talking about how, you know, you fund. I mean, some of us know you are deducted here, but you know, I pay for my parents, their NHIF, and you know, others who uh, are not able to do it. Just paint that picture for us about <coughs> this one person who has to contend with that increased deduction. Yeah. So that one person is me. <laughs> I, I don't know. There is no other fellow. I, I, I actually pay for my parents in right. HF. I mm -hmm. pay for my siblings mm -hmm. and I pay for myself. And I have a mortgage. Okay. So we, they have, uh, the cost of living has all of a sudden gone up as a result of the finance bill. Mm. And uh, what we had budgeted for has now the net reduces. So your employer now is wondering whether he should fire you because there is an increase in the amount of money <coughs> he has to contribute over and above that. So your net has reduced. And the net, um, so it is from this same net that you will also pay for your parents. And you will also pay, and it's 2.7%. They haven't discriminated that. Even what I am paying to my, for my folks is still 2.7%. And worse still, it's on gross. Yeah. You see, so um, the the fund requires money, but um, as uh, Dr. Miskela said, twenty percent of the population and uh, the economist actually, we were at the health dialogue yesterday. Actually, said twenty percent of the population cannot carry a hundred percent of the costs. And therefore, our issue with um, the uh, taxation is actually the cost of living. Fuel has gone up in the last few uh, months by almost 30 percent. That has reduced your income already by that. Um, VAT has gone up by another 8 percent. That has reduced. So when you add NHIF, is uh, the it's, it becomes difficult to see how you will even manage all this. So our problem is that there is a, the, your net as a salaried worker, let's say, mm -hmm. has actually gone down. But unfortunately, again, the salaried workers are the ones who carry everyone. But in, the, in terms of uh, um, um, NHIF, I, I think NHIF needs to recognize itself as an intermediary. 
NHIF is not a bank. Yeah? And uh, part of the problems th they, are, they, are, they are dealing with in terms of fraud are of their own making. Mm -hmm. How so? I'll give you an example. The, you have seen over the last few months uh, providers of service who are supposed to be paid by NHIF are not paid. And again, we would go far. Me, I go and claim monies from hospital. They say NHIF has not paid. You go to NHIF, they say there is fraud. But they are the inducers of fraud using their contractual agreements. So what, what they need to know is that what NHIF can pay or says it can pay is not the cost of the service. I will use in my field Play. obstetrics and gynecology. Uh -huh. NHIF comes and purports that the reimbursement for a normal delivery is 5,000 shillings. And they tell you you cannot charge the patient more. That's one of the contracts. They have different types of contracts. So if I use that example and project it into fraud, what will happen? The small, the big hospitals. Mm -hmm. It's okay, carry on. The big hospitals uh -huh. will reject mm -hmm. that because they know that cannot cover their cost. The small hospitals somewhere there, or these other things that are um, uh, running small institutions, will accept. But what will they do? They will conduct normal deliveries and bill for cesarean sections because the amount may be slightly more. Mm. Yeah? And that's how fraud comes. Two, they will not conduct anything. They'll just bill. You see? But why? It's because they want to generate. So the way I look at it is that one, then two, when the real claims, the people claim correctly, they have done a procedure, they have claimed to NHF, NHF doesn't pay. They closed the system from 2017 to 2020. They closed the system and monies are inside there. Providers closed because you can't pay your bills, mm. you can't pay your providers, you can't pay them. So if you look at it that way, NHIF is NHIF management or the way they do it, or their lack of payment is fraud. And they must realize they are an intermediary. An intermediary means that without the human resource, you cannot, NHIF exists for the people there. The doctor must be there for NHIF to be there. If the doctor is not there or the health workforce, mm -hmm. NHIF is not there. So they should not exist as of in their own. They should pay for services provided. They can't come and claim fraud and then not list those who are fraudulent, mm -hmm. uh, even pay the ones you claim are not fraudulent. And hence, my people said me and they said, the claims adjudication of NHIF needs to go to someone else. Because the problem we are having now is the NHIF is the judge, the jury, and the they are the ones who receive the money, they decide who to pay, and then they decide who not to pay. So what happens is that when they don't pay you, you can't report them to the government. They are the government. So the people have no recourse. And you have seen of late, uh, the, uh, you saw the when people said, we, we do not accept your NHIF card. Why? Because you, NHIF have not paid. So I want to ask a question here because, um, you know, what you are describing paints the picture of perhaps how this fraud takes place, right? It would have to be somebody at NHIF, the medical practitioner, and the institution for which they work. So there's sort of a triad here. And perhaps maybe it's um, you know, the person seeking services. I don't know. Maybe Dr. Nikal, you can um, explain this to us because I you think you are probably not, um, at least for now, not, not a practitioner, not in NHIF, um, you know, and-, and uh, but, but, but I've been, I've been through- so, so how do we do this? I've because been, it seems I've doctors been, and medical practitioners been, are involved, NHIF is involved, so- I've been through this all. Yeah. I've been a provider. Yes. I've been in, 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 in management or managing the healthcare system. Mm. And I've been, a, I've been a member of the board of, of, of NHIF, actually, yeah. it is our time that we yeah. we, pro, we introduce mm. the quality assurance systems. Now, as a country, we cannot talk of one element away from the rest. Yeah. It won't work. What we need is the whole composite of health system to work. Let's just look at, we are looking at money, payment, and fraud. Now we haven't looked at. You now we have to look at the healthcare itself. Mm. 
uh, Dr. Kigundu just talked about why is NHF saying I'm only going to pay 5,000 or 10,000 for cesarean section, while in, in hostel A, the cesarean section is 100,000. In hostel B, it is 50,000. Mm. And drugs. So first of all, we need to know, are there facilities that provide the basic health care at a cost we can afford? That is why I was telling you, in my view, it will have to be the, uh, the middle level private facilities, the mission health facilities, and the public health facilities have to be improved. Now, if we can get those so that their health system is working, they have doctors, they have nurses, they are well paid, they're not going on drugs every day. Mm. Then, then they're not going on strike every day. Mm. Then we also have, must have the supply system working so that if it is CAMS are providing in these public facilities, the, 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 the drugs are always yeah, there. Available. If it's a private, they buy the things they're always. So there has to be a working hospital for NHF to pay. Mm. NHF would have money. So then we will say, in this country, the cost of care, we also need to go and work out the cost of care. The cost of care is high and varied. We need to get in and sort that one out. And, you know, there are consultations. There are bed charges in hostel. Yeah. Yeah. There's pharmacy in hostel. Yeah. There are investigations in hostel. Yeah, yeah there are investigations, uh, whether they're laboratory, whether they're x-ray, uh, then they're they uh, surgery and surgical charges. It is possible. It can be done. That we actually, if you go through the medical practitioners, mm. uh, dentist council, mm. if we go to the doctors, uh, the doctors' union, yeah. Uh, if you go to the pharmacy, we can say, let's agree what is actually the cost of cesarean section. Yeah. And the medical uh, council has actually tried to do that. Yeah. We tried that, when was that, 2000? Yes. I was very enthusiastic on this thing, tried mm -hmm. to get everything done. So that we sit down and say, this is the cost. The average cost yeah. is this. With this, you get it. Drugs. We should even have a national formulary, so that one person is prescribing this antibiotic, another, another one, one is ready, yeah. and one is more expensive. Yeah. There is no rationale. You find where uh, the, 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 the people who actually sell drugs actually motivate the, the providers to use the most current yeah. without evidence that of the whether, simple drug is not yeah, working. Whether it's effective. So that okay. when, we, when we have that working, yes. so we have a cost of care, then they have a, a, a base which they can use and say we will pay for this because, because this they is know the cost. there is somewhere you will get it. If At you want cost. to get something that is more sophisticated, then again, choice. Then, 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 okay. then that is up to you. All right. Now then, we, yes, then, yes, Doctor, because I will, want to move. Uh, then we will bit. have to also look at uh, the, 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 the quality of care. Mm. We have to put a system that ensures that hospitals provide the care that they're supposed to provide. Mm -hmm. So if we just go to NHIF alone, we can improve it as much as we want. But what will happen, I can tell you, if it becomes very efficient, but we don't go and provide uh, the, the health services that will give it, it will all go to the private sector. And it will leave a large number of Kenyans out. So mine is, is very, is very, very simple. And if you go to about, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just say something. Dr. Nikau, yes, I, I want to move forward. One. Yes, please. Now, when you looked at the, the argument that we, taxes are very bad, we, we are protested, I was in parliament. Yeah. But actually, the NHIF, people didn't talk much about it. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk much about it as about what? As about fuel, as about housing, as about digital, because deep inside people, their problem is I'm not getting the service, but really mm. I should pay something a little so that when I'm sick, I don't pay huge. Okay. Dr. Miskela, I'm coming back to you in yes. just a minute. Uh, yeah. There's something that uh, Honorable Nikal brought up that I didn't want to get lost. Huh? Yes. This whole issue around equity. No, I was listening to the chair of NHF the other day saying that they want to bring equity, that those who are earning more should pay more. Yeah. 
the equity in healthcare is not about contribution. The equity is about the quality. In this country, staying alive and dying is just about how much money you have. Mm. Yeah? How come that somebody with the nature have going to a private facility has a higher chance of surviving than in public? And when we cross the road to go to private hospitals, it's not because we have the money. People have sold land, sold the only family cow that yeah. is being milked yeah. for better healthcare. So we must find a way that we look at equity from the end of the service provision. And secondly, the issue of selling healthcare issues. We live in a country where when you talk about NHIF financing, just NHIF, then you close that chapter. Yeah. The next day about human resource issues, then you leave it at that. Then next time you talk about KEMSA, all these are interconnected, even the grants money. Yeah. Why do we have grants coming from the donors being domiciled somewhere else, mm. then NHIF, the other end? They, they are all still paying for the same healthcare system. Yeah? Okay. Why can't you just once just sit down and just take this mother from when she leaves home? Yeah to when she goes back home, what does she need all the way? And to make sure that she can get service. Okay. And it's about quality service. And without paying or without having to sell the only chicken that lays the golden egg at home. All right, that's, that's an important point. And we'll come back and talk about what funding healthcare in this country uh, you know, is about. Because now we're talking about um, health insurance. Dr. Kora, I'm sure you want to uh, respond to quite a bit of what's been uh, raised so far. Uh, you know, equity not necessarily being about uh, the money, but the quality of the healthcare they receive. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Yvonne. Um, we look at it broadly, and I think uh, Dr. Nikal has really brought it out. At the end of the day, it's about the whole ecosystem. It's not just about the finances. So if you look at the government approach towards universal health care and the justification towards uh, the amounts that are being uh, looked at, is the health commodity security needs to work. So in terms of the health products, the medicines, the lab reagents, they need to be there. The human resource that is needed to offer the service needs to be there. That is the second pillar. The third pillar are the integrated health information systems. We need to make sure that if you access a service at a matter hospital, for example, and the next day you want to go, maybe you're not feeling well, you need to go to current, then you don't have to do the same uh, hemoglobin test that you did the day before to be able to, uh, to be managed at this other facility. And then finally, the financing pillar, and that's where NHIF comes in. So there is a whole ecosystem that needs to work for this particular uh, intervention to work. Then two, the main aspect of uh, health financing basically looks at it in terms of the ability to pay. So that's, that's what brings out the equalizing effect. Mm. That on average, if we look at the essential benefit package that has been proposed, and I think you asked about whether there are added benefits. Yes. Yes, there are added benefits. Yeah. And I, I can explain. That. Yes, please do. Yeah. So the actual costs, uh, the actually determined cost of offering that benefit, if every Kenyan was paying, the, every Kenyan household was paying the same amount, is 13,527. But then we are appreciative of the fact that there is a population of about 3.45 million Kenyans that are considered food poor. So if you ask this population to pay the same amount, they will not be able to. They'll be left out of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Then there's a population within the formal sector. That is the easy to reach because they are salaried. Therefore, it's easy to implement. And I think that's what uh, Dr. Gondo has mentioned. Yeah. There's a population of about 4.3 uh, million Kenyans who are in the informal sector, but earners within the informal sector. So yes, they generate an income. This person uh, can be generating as much as six, seven hundred thousand a month, but with the current system, they will still contribute the five hundred. Yeah, compare that to the same person within the formal sector who is earning about uh, thirty thousand, who will contribute almost a similar. But where is the equality so, there then? Because if you're saying you have people within the informal sector who make maybe up to six hundred or seven hundred thousand. But you see, because they're not salaried mm. and therefore not on the ITAC system, Correct. you're saying that person will pay 1,000 shillings yes. a month, yeah. and yet the person who is salaried, yes. who yes. earns 600,000 shillings, you're going to get upwards of 13,500 shillings yeah. a month from them. Correct. So where's the equity there? Yeah. So now that's the explanation for the 2.75%. Yes. This is not just for the formal sector. It's basically for everybody. And if you look at the engagements that have been there with His Excellency and also the CS, they mentioned that there are community health promoters that are being brought into the system. 
each community health promoter is, uh, uh, is allocated 100 households. So they are able to tell that this is the ability, it's called means testing, this is the ability of this household to be able to pay, regardless of whether they are in the informal sector. So the eventual, uh, or rather what is targeted, is that everybody, regardless of whether you are in the formal or informal, will be contributing 2.7% of the household income. So it's not... It's not uh, just targeted to the formal sector. Okay, I just, I want to talk about the informal sector for a minute because, you know, currently, um, you know, they pay 500 shillings a month. Yes. What has been the collection of that? And I've heard a little few problems that have been mentioned around that, you know, you realize you uh, need some health care, so you'll come in and it's 500 a month and you live and pay for the year, which is what, 1,200. Um, and then the claims that you're making are for, you know, much bigger ailments and you haven't been a consistent payer. Is it a fact that those who are unemployed and paying that 500 are not necessarily consistent? If they're not consistent and it has been difficult for NHIF to even get that 500 a month, mm. then what's the guarantee that you will now charge them a thousand shillings right. if getting the 500 shillings from them voluntarily yeah. is not as easy? Is NHIF now putting itself in a position of enforcer. So you yes. couldn't get the 500 shillings. Yes. Now you're again going to say, <laughs> let me get the 1,000 shillings when the 500 was difficult to begin with. Yes. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give you some stats as far as uh, uh, what, uh, what you're explaining is called adverse selection. Mm -hmm. yeah. These individuals who come in when they need the service pay a minimum amount and then exit immediately after the service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We did a survey over a 36 month period. And for the population that contributes for just four months and exits, that's about uh, 2,000 shillings, 30% of them were accessing a maternity benefit. So they would basically come in at month four or five of pregnancy, uh -huh. contribute 2,000 shillings, have caesarean section financed, and then they exit. Now, if you look at the population that maintains their contributions for 36 months, uh, about 25% of this population has chronic conditions. And on average, if you look at the cost of dialysis, it's more than 900,000 a year. So this cohort would contribute 6,000 shillings, yeah. utilize 900,000, right. but then you are not even assured that they will maintain their, as yeah. long as they have a condition, most likely they're going to maintain. Okay. So that's, that's the level of adverse selection that we're looking at. In terms of figures, that means that for every one shilling being generated from the informal sector, uh, about uh, three shillings, two, sh two shillings, 50 cents to three shillings is being spent on the claims. That kind of uh, medical loss ratio is actually not sustainable over time. It's going to deplete the resources. Mm -hmm. Now, what has been done is to make uh, health insurance a mandatory product. Mm -hmm. The issue is how do you get to this informal sector? Because formal sector is not such a big problem. The issue is the informal sector. And that's where this, uh, the investment in these CHPs come in, uh, the community health practitioners, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the promoters. It's not that everybody has to pay a thousand shillings. I think uh, if, if uh, we've had public participation on the exercise, the documents have been drafted and it's one of the uh, clauses that have actually been dropped because of the, uh, the, whether it's actually realistic to implement such a thing. Okay, so you're so saying the, the clause? The clause. Just say that again that so we're clear? The clause that was looking at the informal sector contributor contributing a thousand shillings. That has been dropped? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Mm. Okay. All right. So what these informal sector contributors would do is that there's a community health promoter. They've been allocated households. This uh, community health promoter has two kits. One is a kit that does uh, a means testing for that household so that we are able to establish this is the estimated income of this household. Mm. Then this household also makes a declaration. Based on what I'm able to earn, I'll be able to contribute this much. Mm. So uh, they contribute that much and then there's a, there's a subsidy to be able to cover for the, for the additional costs. Okay. Then the, the next bit is yeah. there are those aggregators that help for, for this to work. We appreciate that a good proportion of the informal sector is actually in agriculture. Their income is seasonal. So if you ask for them to pay in January, they are, mm. the probability that they'll be able to pay is going to be low. Yeah. So aggregate them into a circle. Yeah? So that circle takes up the costs, they're able to pay for the members, and then when the income comes in, it, it builds. The other bit is premium financing. 
we have uh, two uh, contracts with different banks. They are willing to pay the premiums for these members and then recover it gradually over time. Over time. Because that pooled or rather that amount that is significant at one point might not be affordable to majority of the population. But if you split this over time, they'll be able to contribute that kind of an income. Okay, before we move forward, I want us to just uh, get uh, two more things out of the way with you um, first. You're asking for an increase. What are you offering for that? If you want me to pay more, what are the increased or uh, better benefits uh, that, that I get? Uh, thank you. In terms of the increase, I mentioned that we are looking at how do we get value. One of the things that is most expensive at the moment is management of cancer. And when we estimate how much we are likely to spend if 85% of the population is covered, we are looking at a bill of about 71 billion shillings. Now, at the moment, what is being financed by the fund is sessions of treatment, not the treatment plan. So if you finance six sessions of treatment, and then the patient is not able to finance the other four that are needed, mm. this patient drops out. You will have spent about 600,000 shillings, but you will not get the treatment outcome that you're looking for. So one of the benefits that is being offered with this package is that we finance the whole treatment plan. Uh, the, fund might not be able to, the fund is not able to take up all the costs. Mm. So in the negotiation with government, they put in a fund which is the critical illness and emergency fund. So it supplements these additional monies that will be needed to be able to finance the whole treatment plan. The other issue is ICU. At the moment, the reimbursement for critical care is at the same rate as the bed rate uh, yeah. for the general ward. Yeah, yeah. That means that there is an out-of-pocket element mm. of about 60-70% uh, that the patient is meeting. Now, these additional uh, amounts are meant to make sure that uh, the uh, critical care that is needed for this patient is actually provided for. The third bit is accidents and emergencies. We have ambulance evacuation, we have the hospital. But then when the patient lands at the hospital, there is that accident and emergency component of resuscitation and maintaining this patient. At the moment, it's not financed. So you might finance the ambulance, and uh, the cost that we are spending on that is actually quite significant. We will finance with the bed, but managing or maintaining that life at the point at which they get to the hospital is not there. So it's one of the additions. The other bit is, uh, and I think uh, my colleague Dr. Nikal has mentioned this in other sittings that we've had with Parliament, is we are spending so much when it comes to uh, chronic illnesses, but we are investing very little in, in preventive primary, and promotive yeah, health. Primary healthcare, yeah. So one of the additions is the screening aspect for cancers. Breast cancer, cervical cancer, the boil cancers, and the testicular and uh, prostate cancers. Mm. So there is a particular budget of about nine point, uh, about six point nine billion, that has been costed within that amount. It should be able to take care of the screening, so that one we are able to detect the disease early, early enough. Yeah. Two, the intervention is early enough. We don't have to wait until stage two or uh, stage three or four, like what we are which getting now. Which even lowers the cost. Which pushes the, because it pushes yeah. up the cost. Okay. So those are some of the interventions that have been, or the, those are the additional values that are there to this two point seven five percent. Okay. Um. I want to talk about financing healthcare uh, because I think for many of us, when we talk about financing healthcare, we think NHIF. That's just one part of it. Uh, for many of my viewers who say, well, you know, I, I think what you have all talked about, the full experience from one end to the other, from when you leave your home, go to a hospital, and the hope is always that you come back and you're recovered and can carry on, um, you know, with your life. What does it take to finance healthcare in the country, Dr. Nikal? Because I think sometimes we focus on NHIF and say, yeah, but you know, we're paying all our monies to NHIF. Therefore, uh, the doctor should have, uh, first of all, we should have doctors. We should be able to afford to pay doctors, nurses, clinical officers, and, and all the healthcare officials that we would have the drugs that we need, that we would have the equipment that uh, is required for the service uh, providers to, uh, you know, give uh, the adequate service. What is financing healthcare and how do we look at it holistically? You see, financing healthcare, uh, the, 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 there are components. You can have the tax. Just straightforward, when they take VAT, when they take this, or they do that. Yeah. Even right now in the country, there's a huge chunk that comes from that. Uh, if you look at uh, public uh, hospitals, uh, the, 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 the human resource, is actually to a large extent financed through tax. Yeah. Uh, even the drug supply mm. is to a large extent financed through tax. The money that is coming from NHIF to public hospitals 
is actually money that they, for now it is to a large extent improvement of the facilities. So there is money from, from tax that is coming. Then there is insurance that is also coming. Yeah. That Now insurance can be two. You can have uh, social health insurance where NHIF is, uh, or you can have private uh, insurance. That is still money going into 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 healthcare financing. Then you have people who actually just pay from their pockets. These are the people we don't we 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 we, we, we really we don't like this because there's no single person in this country, however rich they are, who can actually take health care mm. completely yeah. paid for. Mm -hmm. The rich go around it by taking expensive insurance. Mm. So it is insurance. So what we are trying to do in this country is to actually make social health insurance so big that the what comes from tax is minimal and uh, what comes from the people's pocket is also minimal, minimal yeah. because that hurts people. Yeah. And then you pull it. Now, when we are talking NHIF, do you know there are still government uh, employees that have a different insurance yeah. that we are saying are actually being catered for in the private sector. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the public service, the police, the, mm. the, the, even the teachers. Yeah. So that money should all come and be pulled together. In, together. Okay. I, Snikal, I believe there's enough money in this country mm. to run our health services. Now, what is the key that will open this, in my view? If we could get the public health services to where they were in the mid-70s, even into late-70s, I know it will be hard for you to believe that there was a time <laughs> that Kenyatta Hostel was better than Naga Khan. <laughs> it will be hard for you to believe that when my first daughter was born in 1979, maternity in Kenyatta, which is now the MTC mm. uh, office block, yeah. was actually better than maternity in Nairobi. We can get there. If we get there so that the, the public facilities give what is acceptable, acceptable level of care. Yeah. We are not talking of when you go to a bed, you have a TV and yeah. you, there's a menu, you are taking the meals. That, that's not here. That, that's out. If we, get, if we get that, like let me say, if you know the level of uh, uh, maybe uh, Avenue here mm. or even Avenue in Kisumu, a, a little bit around uh, MP Shah or maybe a little lower, if you got that, that level or a well-running mission hostel, yeah. you go to a place like probably Nazareth, if we can get most of our people getting care there, NHIF would cover most of the cost. If we rub fraud, we have not gone, gone deeply into fraud. Yeah. We thought we would. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and let's let's yeah. get in there because I asked him about the yeah, fraud so, and he so, talked about yeah. So the if other... that was taken care of, yeah. Now this mandatory should be compulsory. Yeah, mandatory means compulsory. Yeah. We should even find ways. If if things were okay, I know I'll get treatment. It would therefore the government would be justified to say. If you do not have uh, evidence that you have, N you have paid for NHIF, you are even denied some services, which means you can't go and, and get your driving license if you don't have NHIF. Okay. Now, uh, let me tell you, yeah. I don't think it is, it's a fun thing. Japan were very, very strict. Difference because then they started with people providing health for themselves. So people are hard on each other. People are being chased. So if it's mm -hmm. mandatory, it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. Why we have a difficulty of punishing people for not paying NHIF is because we not have we have, don't have a, a service which they are consuming without paying for. Okay, I want us to talk about um, you know the issue I think I had raised in the beginning, and that is the issue of trust, and that is the issue of fraud. So. I want to come back to you, Bonasiu, and read a couple of messages. Here is one. Corruption has bedeviled NHI for decades. No one is addressing this. Leave the remittances where they are until transparency is assured. Um, 
<laughs> Here's another one from Juliet. Uh, well, it says Abuju on Twitter. A lot still needs to be done in order to streamline things at NHIF. As long as corruption is still at its best, as is the case now, no amount of words or policy will change anything. Um, uh, here's another one. Um, I think Don Sabo is talking about, uh, you know, government and parasitals being allowed to get uh, private insurance. Mm -hmm. um, here is another one um, uh, from Ronald Award. The scam can't end when the contributor doesn't know the content of what the doctors bill and request from NHIF is. That is the service and amount that is billed. Contributor only gets notification of attendance as at now. All of these questions um, are are huge and they really are about, um, you know, service delivery, about uh, corruption. Jacob Otaya says, NHF is a hopeless entity. My dad was hospitalized for a minor operation which couldn't be done due to non-response from NHIF. We had to take him back home. The hospital is asking for 150,000 for the operation, which we as a family cannot afford. Hopeless NHIF. Yeah. Um, you know, there's all of these questions about graft and about fraud. Dr. Nikal says there is enough money. The other doctors here have raised that issue. Um, you know, here is, that is something you must address. There are some assurances, many that you must make that says 10 billion shillings in fraudulent claims and that's just one of them and so many others. What would happen, paint for us the picture, if all of these scams didn't take place? Would the money be enough? Mm. It would be significant. Okay. Yeah. I would respond to this by looking at the fraud risk and what we are doing about it. Because, mm -hmm. um, yes, we need to reassure the public that uh, they, there is a risk, but we are doing everything to reduce that risk. So as an insurer, we've uh, taken time to look at if we were not intervening on uh, intervention A, what would be the impact? And from one of those uh, studies about two years ago, the impact is 29%. So that's, that's the kind of risk that we're looking at. In the working environment that we are in, if you look at uh, the commercial insurers within the country, the figures being given in terms of the risk for medical fraud is 25 to 40%. So that's how significant the risk is to the whole insurance ecosystem, not just uh, NHIF. So as a financier, there are those things that we are doing, and it's an approach that is looking at the whole picture. There is the benefit. I think uh, uh, Dr. Kigon mentioned about it. How has the benefit been structured that it simulates the fraud itself? So if you look at uh, the benefits, they are a lot more explicit. And these were recommendations that were made by the Health Benefits Advisory Panel that sat about uh, four years ago. So a good number of these recommendations have actually been implemented. But then, yet we still see cases of fraud. Yes. Um, and you that's, know, more that's, often that's than not. So, I mean, yeah. great interventions. Yeah. So, Are they the so, right yeah. interventions? Because we still see more scams uh, coming out day after day. Yes. So th there is the benefit bit. There is the member bit. The member needs to be educated about what, they are, uh, what is available to them so that if they went to a facility and a total blood count is charged, then they know that they are actually entitled it, uh, to it as part of their cover. So they should not be charged for that. Then the next bit is the system itself, and that's where digitization comes in. Because we are looking at uh, 2.8 million uh, claims coming in in a year. Then the human workforce that is available to do that is not sufficient to be able to adequately address that. So there is a strong aspect of digitization, and there is a plan over the next four years to actually digitize most of the services. And the target that we are looking at is auto adjudication of 80% of the claims. So a system that is smart enough to be able to process most of these claims without having to have human interventions. And then we have the text service. What needs to be done now that we know it has been rolled out and we know the number of responses that are there, the next thing is to make it interactive. So if uh, Dr. Miskela gets uh, a message that your number has been used to make this request, there's also an option of him declining or accepting that they're actually the ones who have made that request. If a patient gets a message that your card has been, this and this amount has mm. been charged to your card at facility X, they have a way of accepting or declining. So those are some of the measures mm. that are in place to be able to address that. Mm -hmm. But then we have to look at it from an ecosystem perspective. Even Yes, Dr. Miskela. I've been listening to this talk about fraud, and it's more like from the healthcare provider a bit of it. Uh -huh. Yeah, but the biggest, some of the biggest challenges we have as healthcare workers, 
is the NHF staff themselves. When you send your claim, they first extort money from you to give your contract. Then finally, they also extort money for you to pay your claims. As long as you have those 30 billions lying idle in those NHF accounts, he said very well, NHF is not a bank. You collect money and pay bills. So as you have the money lying there, that money will tempt somebody. And then somebody will steal it. Not just the healthcare provider, but even within the government, I'm sure that there are people who always make phone calls here and there that, oh, it's going to pay, sir, pay like a department. Because we know for a fact there'll be rumors going in the, within the healthcare circle that the money that was in the NHF was diverged for something else. That's why they could not pay hospitals. The other thing is that healthcare is big business, not just in Kenya, but world over. Countries that have looked at it from that perspective have gone astray. From America, the richest country on this world. They have made healthcare business, so the rich can get the best, but the poor continue to die. Almost a 17 year difference in life expectancy. And sadly, it's creeping into Kenya now, where somebody sits back and says that, how can I make money from health? Yeah? Countries like the UK have an NHS system. NHS, yeah. Social system. Yeah. Peru, Thailand. But you come beside, we are literally killing the public health system so the private health system can thrive and book and profit. And so long as we don't correct that, then no matter how much you'll tax the workers, that money will never be enough for the appetite of the capitalist. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. <laughs> Secondly, is that when it's a, the budget, uh, people met in Abuja sometime, and we agreed on the 50% allocation mm. on healthcare. Yeah? Then how far are we to the country? There's the bit that the worker can do, yeah. this bit. But have the government held their begin, as I finish, that the workers are also not afraid of paying that 3%, whatever you want to give it. Mm. The biggest challenge that the worker and their dependents are complaining about is that how can an NHF hold hospitals accountable? That you can't just wake up today and say that I'm level four with one medical officer and no consultant. You claim you can do a CT scan, they're not there. Then you give them a contract. And how do you hold them accountable to whatever they promised? Can an NHF hold the service providers to account to what they signed of? Not just, oh, we are level six in Nakuru, but when you go there, you don't have a medical officer in the pediatric ward. I'm just giving you an example, yeah? So you can check on that. And finally, as I finish on this debate, can we find a way of reinforcing so that the money that comes into healthcare and you pay me the back to the hospital remains in healthcare? Currently, that money, when it goes to the county accounts, they go and use it to pave roads because healthcare is very personal. When you die, it's a real private death. People don't carry twigs when people die. They only carry twigs and the roads are bad. So Mwashimi here will fix the road first before improving the hospital if he's a governor. Yeah? Can we ring fence healthcare resources that when you give me back that a million shillings for delivery, I'll use it to buy drugs, to buy gloves, so that the women don't have to pay in HIF mm. and still and come with buying gloves and cotton wool to the hospital. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Dr. Kigondo? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I think um, NHIF is the best thing after sliced bread that um, we have. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. If... <laughs> it sounds NH like sarcasm, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> NHIF now is a national asset. Value must be sold. Mm -hmm. And when value is sold, the population owns it. And when they own it, it becomes difficult. And that's why we are having this conversation, so to speak. Kenya Medical Association entered into NHIF to provide the bridge between the pair and the population. They are the ones who represent the population. Why do I say so? Before, NHIF used to pay for the bed. Yeah, used to pay for the bed alone. Yeah. We insisted as Kenya Medical Association that we need to expand these services because the people we see as doctors mm. don't need a bed. The bed does not treat you. Mm. So we put in surgical packages. When surgical packages came, then a lot of people benefited, you see, and also a lot of health workers because they were operating and getting better. Everyone and health of people improved and yeah. people started saying, ah, this is NHIF not. The other services that they brought in, dialysis, Mm. Dialysis was brought in that saved a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah? But dialysis was not um, out of context. So government helped reduce the expenditure on health by pumping in three things. Mm -hmm. And three things that you must solve for you to make health affordable. One, 
Human Resources for Health. And the association has always advocated for Health Service Commission, which a lot of people oppose. But that is how to streamline human resources for health and make um, human resources go to the lowest levels. Two, the medical equipment scheme. If I give you the impact of the medical equipment scheme, what we usually know is the bad part of it. Mm. The good side of it yeah. is that it actually reduced the cost of services. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. An MRI in South Africa is 120,000 MRI of the head. In Kenya, it is 16,000. Why? Because of MES. Before MES, there were no, the only four, mm. four hospitals in 2011 were giving dialysis. After MES, there are four, how many are they? They are, and that's how you reduce the cost, just to save uh, NHIF. And finally, healthcare financing, using NHIF and other ways as we call tax funded. So for us, government input into the healthcare system, both human resource, healthcare financing, and medical equipment is the way of healthcare financing. And finally, you have to devolve specialized care to the lowest level yeah. so that you catch disease early and devolve mm. care. Mm -hmm. And that way, healthcare financing uh, will be saved. We don't have to say, oh, being more money, charge us 2.7% yeah. and all. Yeah. So if we look at it in that context, then we will have done good healthcare financing and saved NHIF from some. And finally, on corruption, yeah. if there is nothing like NHIF is corrupt or not. Kenyans, Kenyans uh, may, it is your behavior, it's your ethos. You, if you as uh, whoever you are, you are corrupt, then you are put in NHIF. You are the one who is corrupt. It's not the NHIF. Well, but we would expect the um, appointing authority no, and the can't. systems. No. So you're saying NHIF is incapable of dealing with no. corrupt individuals? We are saying when you are in Kenya and there's corruption, you don't say it's NHIF. You say in Kenya, it will be anywhere. But does that sound like an excuse? OK, so we're all corrupt. Then, you know, we let's are not, not raise corrupt. the No issue. one said, me, I'm not corrupt. OK. So the, I but just, you're saying uh, Kenyans are corrupt, corrupt, but you're not corrupt? We are saying the, the, <laughs> if, if in your country you yeah. are saying uh, people are uh, corrupt, yeah. then you are surprised that NHIF is corrupt, then you are, you are, you're blaming the wrong thing. So okay. my solution is education. You have to start teaching children not to be corrupt. You have to teach ethos. You have to teach patriotism. Okay, let me ask. How do loyalty you... pledge. How many? Do you know the loyalty how pledge? How do you? <laughs> well, whether I know the loyalty pledge or not. It is, helps patriotism. It, it does help patriotism. Yeah. However, there needs to be a system that severely punishes yeah. anybody who, um, you know, misappropriates funds. Yeah. And sometimes we use big words like misappropriation yeah. and corruption, who steals money that is meant for the sick. Yeah. Do you believe... Yeah. And you sit on the board of, of, of NHIF, the Kenya, Kenya Medical Association. Yes. Do you believe that within the NHIF, that they have the robust measures to be able to deal very, you know, it has to be swift, it has to be stinging, yeah. it has to be immediate. Um, that is such a deterrent that yeah. you will not touch yeah. money that is meant for the sick. Yeah. Do you believe that NHIF yeah. sitting on the board yeah. has the right mechanisms yeah. to stop fraud or basically theft yeah. of funds that Kenyans contribute to it every month? Yeah. There are two things. One, if NHIF did its job, there would be no fraud. And I started with what are the causes of fraud. One, a provider has provided service. You have refused to pay them and they have billed. Then they, they, their businesses start closing. Then they now, uh, someone in HIF calls and tells them, we can pay you, but you know where? Yeah? You see, we can pay you. Then that's how corruption starts. If that provider was paid, then there would be no fraud because they would continue with their services. Yeah. And uh, that's one. Two yeah. mm -hmm. is um, uh, the people you put there, you, you, you can only be judged by your action. We can't say you are a thief, but we put you there and you don't steal and you are. So you judge people according to that. The thief, you deal with the thief. You do Can not NHIF now involve deal with everyone. Let, let me come. Can NHIF deal yeah. with the thief? Yes. Okay. Let, let's not dismiss what he said. Okay. The ethos of a nation. Yeah. If the ethos of a nation is corruption, then it is very difficult to deal with corruption in one sector. Mm -hmm. But it, you should health can why is there so much noise about corruption at nhif 
why is there so much corruption uh, issues of health workers in at county levels going on strike? Mm. Why is there so much noise about cancer? The issue is health is sensitive, people yeah. are concerned. Yeah. What are in these places are everywhere. Mm. But people can say, let me just ask something, one thing only. Mm. Then I'll come to specifically what we can do. NSSF. Yeah. Have you ever heard people make noise about where the money from NSSF goes? Yeah. Do you know any one person, any muse who is living comfortably because he has been paying money to NSSF? <laughs> Nobody. I don't even know one who has received mm. their money. Have you ever had people make noise? This is going on every mm. day. Mm. So, uh, so it is health is sensitive. It's an indicator yeah. of the sickness in the society. Yeah. In the society, but we can do something. Yeah. Okay. When the CEO one, the corrupt, the corrupt, the, the the fraud in NH, in in, in NHIF, mm. I'll take it in two components. Yeah. One. There is the management when they are doing procurement of other things mm -hmm. which are not directly health. There are also, you can, when you are procuring vehicles, when you are procuring uh, security, administrative when you are procuring costs. administrative costs okay. can go up. And for a long time, that is where our eyes were. Yeah. And we have a lot, and we pushed them to actually try and bring the administrative costs down. Mm -hmm. down. They brought it down. But there was a little sleight of hand. Mm. When the, 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 the contribution went up, the percentage of the administrative went down. Mm. But they also actually tried. In my mind, that is still a problem, okay. but we deal with. But then now, the bigger one is the, is the, is the fraud the in the health mm. system, in the claim. Mm. Unless it is, my colleague, the, the thing is, the staff in NHIF are involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, That's, now just wait for that. Yes. The health providers are involved. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the two collude. Yes. And in my way, if you ask Terry, what is the first thing you should do? Take, have a forensic audit of all hospitals where you are paying money. Just take a simple thing. I pay you so much million in a year, what is your output in the number of patients seen? Mm -hmm. That alone will start to tell you where it is going. So find out who are doing this. Strengthen the quality assurance. I think you are heading it before. It started actually when I was there and they didn't want me in the finance committee. So they said, go and start quality assurance for us. That's a different story. <laughs> so that I insist, we insisted mm. that the quality assurance mm which can stop fraud in, H in HIF must involve technical people. Yes. We actually put that a medical person should be there, supported by nurses and so on. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because if you say this person stayed for 10 days with malaria, only a technical person will say, no, no. that's yeah. not right. Yeah. If, you have 10, if you have 50 beds, and we, you, when you are coming out, you are saying, you have I don't know how many admissions, somebody can say, no, Send somebody in there at the patients on the bed. If yeah. they're on the bed, are they actually being treated? Yeah. People oh, can yeah. go and sleep there on the day of the bed, of the of the <laughs> inspection who are not sick. Yes. Who are not sick. Yeah. Now, if there is a claim for MRI, it is actually medical people who can say this claim. Yes. I tell you, I don't want to mention names. I think the, the policemen were being recruited and then some medical organization was asked to do a physical test. People who have been uh, examined and now are just going for tests. And all of them got, I think, MRI or CT scan. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, that's that's. I, uh, please, I, I want us to, to so conclude. So now, what I'm saying, Dr. Nicole, I, I, please. I'm actually living with action. <laughs> yes, please. Look at your quality assurance staff. Mm. Look at their collusion with the health providers. Yeah. Go and actually look at the claims people are making. This edu, how many kids are actually being paid for who never went to hospital? Mm -hmm. Doctor, you can do this. Yeah. And if you bring a big thing like happened in 98, and we see big hostels, the managers going, people even died when they were actually exposed in 90, it was 98. Yeah. So do that, okay. then people will feel. All right. Um, but the ethos of, of corruption, well, yeah, that's a bigger conversation about who we are as a nation. And like um, I think both of you have said, yes, it's, it's, it seeps into everything. Look, gentlemen, we've really run out of time and, and our conversation has gone. I want to give you the final word, um, you know, Dr. Kohora, 
and as you do that, please answer this. So we remember in May, um, the Rural Hospitals Association said they will no longer be taking, um, you know, NHIF cards because they haven't received a single coin uh, from April to June. Uh, making them unable to pay salaries and, you know, layoffs, because this is money they spend, and they spent at their facilities, and they're supposed to get uh, money back. And you can imagine, this Rural Hospitals Association, that's the same place we've been talking about having primary health care, you know, at the level where, you know, we're meeting Kenyans at their point of need. What's the situation with that? Okay, uh, thank you. F for that, yes, there's a group of uh, 350, about 350 hospitals. So they give a notification that uh, because there were delays, they were going to withdraw the services to the members. Uh, that was done on uh, 30th, and uh, by the 16th of the subsequent month, uh, the monies had been paid. So the 16th of uh, June, the monies which were pending, it was basically a, the cohort of uh, capitation payments. Those uh, monies had been paid and they resumed the service. But uh, I would like to mention... What caused the delay? Now, uh, I'll just give you a background. Capitation is a method of payment for outpatient services. Now, for uh, the facility is meant to be paid within the first 30 days of a quarter. But then it's subject to them filing returns. So that they, we need to know how many patients were actually treated in the previous quarter, so that by the time you are making disbursements, you can actually defend why you are, you are spending this kind of money. And we are looking at a, a budget of about 7.7 .7 billion shillings a year. So we, we actually called all the providers under the Kenya Healthcare Federation, and we told them, this is our challenge. We have more than 7,000 providers in this panel. But the, man, the, the providers who have actually filed returns is 2.2%. So there is quite a, an amount of money that we've already spent that we are not able to defend because we don't have any file returns on this. And we brought in all the providers and explained that. And we made a commitment that the first payments that would be made in June will be related to offsetting those capitation amounts. And that was actually done. On the 5th of June, there was a disbursement of more than f uh, 540 million. On the 12th of June, there was a, another disbursement to uh, several sets of providers. And on 14th, we have set to a total of about 1.7 billion shillings. So all the providers who had actually expressed the concerns have re are resumed their services. Okay, you get, uh, the <laughs> you have one minute, Dr. Miskela, literally one. I'll talk to Kenyans, mm. that uh, I want Kenyans to be proactive around the matters of healthcare. Mm. I'm tired of this idea that every time a pregnant woman dies or a child dies, we say God has picked somebody from the, for the flower farm. Let us hold our leaders accountable. Because currently, the unions, the doctors, the healthcare workers are crying alone that there's a problem with the healthcare system. Can the public join us so that we can hold the politicians, the duty bearers, accountable so that as the NHIF fixes its problem, the service providers are also holding the end of the bargain. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We really, do you want one minute? Mm. This is an HIF now. Minute. I want to give you one minute. Yeah, Dr. Nikal, it has to be one minute. <laughs> yeah, it will be one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want him to have Dr. the final Nicole, word. one minute. So, one, 60 seconds, oh, okay. literally. <laughs> Go for it. Dr. Terry, fight corruption as much as you can in NHIF to give confidence. Public hostels, governors, and the national government improve government hostels and those hostels so that people have confidence that they will be treated while well, you have done that. We do that, then I can ask Kenyans pay NHIF. Okay. Uh, in the spirit of fairness, Dr. Kigondo, one minute. Um, I think uh, they need to employ doctors in NHIF to do the claim thing. You, you cannot have a child having testicular torsion where testes are treated and yeah. someone, uh, you do a pre-authorization and they ask you for an X-ray which is not done for, pre you need people who know what they are doing. I think they need to employ doctors. And finally, NHIF is not supposed to be a saving scheme. It's supposed to pay for services. And I think we need to stop the story. Let us pay the facilities who have provided service today. This story of, uh, I, we don't want, let's pay for services provided. Okay, so you now get the last minute, <laughs> Dr. Kohora. One minute, just like everybody else. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, I think my message to the Kenyans is that our health is our responsibility. 
And uh, when we look at uh, our figures in terms of how much are we returning to uh, the economy just by financing cohorts of healthcare, we are looking at figures of 380%. By just making sure that you adequately cover for cardiovascular conditions in the country, how much do you save in terms of the productivity benefit? The number of days that they would have spent in hospital, the number of days that they would have spent trying to get to the hospital, the value of the deaths that would have been saved, we are looking at significant proportions. It is our responsibility to make sure that the healthcare system works. As the fund, our motto is that we're not leaving anyone behind as far as healthcare is concerned. We need to pull the resources together, we need to distribute the risks. And that's what we are doing as far as social health insurance is concerned. Thank you, Dr. Kuhora, Dr. Nikal, Dr. Miskela, and Dr. Kigondo. I do not believe I've ever been in a room with so many doctors when I am well. <laughs> I have been in a room with so many doctors when I am unwell. So today, truly, is there a doctor in the house? Yes, we had four of them discussing healthcare in the country and, um, you know, how to fund it and how to ensure that you get the best quality of care. So much of your feedback, which I will get into here on the explainer as we continue. Wasn't that like sort of healthcare explained, um, you know, over the last uh, half an hour or so? Let's take a break. That conversation takes uh, a break for tonight. We could obviously talk about this a lot more. But when we come back, your feedback on the conversation we have had.